During the mid part of the 20th century, a steady stream of visitors traveled to the ancient land of Tamil Nadu in the southern region of India to experience the remarkable presence and clear teachings of Sri Ramana Maharshi. The Maharshi's name needs little introduction, for then, as now, seekers who wish to awaken from the powerful illusion of the ego and abide in the perfect peace of their true nature have turned to his teachings. There was a spontaneous simplicity and humility about him, a sense of universal equality and heart-melting love. His actions were natural and spontaneous and reflected a life that was fully identified with the one consciousness, the self in all beings. Carl Jung had planned to visit the Maharshi, but for various reasons never made it. Jung writes about Ramana. What we find in the life and teachings of Sri Ramana is the purest of India with its breath of world-liberated and liberating humanity. It is a chant of millenniums. In India, he is the whitest spot in a white space. Born in 1879 to pious parents, the child was named Venkataraman. Aside from several auspicious indications surrounding his birth, there were few specific signs that the young boy's destiny would take a spiritual turn. When he was only 16 years old, attending high school in the city of Madurai in the South Indian state of Tamil Nadu, he had a remarkable experience of death, which led to a permanent awakening to the deathless spirit. Arriving at the sacred hill Arunachala, he spent the next 54 years either on its slopes or foothills. People from all over the world came to sit in his presence, which had the profound effect of quieting the mind and providing glimpses of the perfect peace which is our natural state. The Maharshi's teachings are uniquely suited to modern life and provide for a clear and balanced synthesis of head and heart. He was not concerned with theory or philosophical discussion. Rather, he consistently guided the seeker back to the source of real being with its theoretical basis in Advaita or non-duality. Ramana taught that we exist as the Supreme Self at all times. We need only awaken to this reality by seeking the source of the ego or I thought and abide in the self that we always are. He referred to this method as self-inquiry. The path of self-inquiry frees one from the unceasing fear and turmoil resulting from taking the ego to be real. By becoming free of the ego illusion, one experiences true freedom and supreme peace. It is this path that takes one from the apparent duality of the individual and the world to the bliss of one's real nature. Through this awakening to self-awareness, even by imperfect glimpses, one begins to sense a reality not confined to the ego's world. And this current of awareness is ultimately revealed as the self, pure consciousness. The Maharshi generally taught in silence, and the sincere seeker would often experience a silent influence in the heart. Verbal expression of this silence was always given freely to all and frequently combined with humor and laughter. While his physical presence was overwhelming and his majesty and beauty indescribable, 
he remained completely natural, simple, unassuming, and wholly unaffected. Join me as we explore the life and teachings of Ramana Maharshi and turn back to the source of abiding happiness, the source in which all questions and doubts resolve themselves in the awareness of our true self. And this is where the story begins. For a few people began to gather around the young sage, seeking his guidance. Perhaps it was simply the fulfillment of bodily karma or the motiveless compassion that reacted to the desire for guidance on the part of those sincere seekers. But something seemed to draw him back to a fuller bodily life. Slowly, seekers would approach him to have a doubt cleared or to simply sit in his peaceful presence. Shiva Prakasham Pillay was one of the early visitors who became captivated by the young sage. The teachings on self-inquiry as given to Shiva Prakasham Pillay became the key message of the Maharshi. The great Sanskrit scholar and ascetic Vashishta Ganapati Muni had mastered a broad range of scriptures, disciplines, and meditation practices. Feeling frustrated that he had not progressed further in experience, Ganapati remembered the young sage living on the hill and approached him with great emotion, desiring to know the true meaning of tapas, or spiritual practice. The young sage gazed at him silently for a while and then replied, If one watches whence the notion I arises, the mind is absorbed into that. That is tapas. When a mantra is repeated, if one watches the source from which the mantra sound is produced, the mind is absorbed in that. That is tapas. This response on the part of the young ascetic filled Ganapati Muni with joy, and he declared that Venkataraman should now be known as Bhagavan Sri Ramana Maharshi. Those who surrounded Ramana during his lifetime came from very diverse cultural and social backgrounds. What they had in common was a sincere aspiration to experience true inner peace and freedom. Ramana never saw anyone as separate from himself and had no disciples in the conventional sense. He told a visitor in 1936 the person may call himself my disciple or devotee. I do not consider anyone to be my disciple. If people call themselves my disciples, I do not approve or disapprove. In my view, all are alike. What can I say to them? He regularly said that the guru was not the physical form, and guidance continues after the demise of the body. Therefore, there was no need to create a lineage or provide for transmission in order to carry on successorship. Several well-known devotees expressed the different ways in which they experienced Maharshi's presence and teachings. The inquiry is not a mental investigation such as psychologists might indulge in. It is not a probing into the faculties, urges, memories, or tendencies of one's conscious or subconscious mind, but a quest of the pure I am-ness that lies behind all these. To meet the needs of various seekers, Ramana did expound various doctrines, but we have heard him say that his true teaching, firmly based on his own experience, is ajata, that which was never born. 
the most touching sight is the number of tiny children up to about seven years of age who climb the mountain all on their own to come and sit near Maharshi even though he may not speak a word or hardly look at them for days together. They do not play but just sit quietly there in perfect contentment. You are the self. Ramana tells us, nothing but the self. Anything else is just imagination. So be the self here and now. There is no need to run off to a forest or shut oneself in a room. Carry on with your essential activities, but free yourself from association with the doer of them. Self is the witness. You are are that. Bhagavan has written a song whose import is that the path is very easy if the mind is not allowed to stray after the senses and directed to inquire into its true nature. Certainly the heart will be reached and the self perceived. The teaching of Bhagavan has acquired worldwide recognition and attracted earnest seekers from all five continents as much for its simplicity as for its sturdy rationality which appeal both to the head and the heart. It can however be summed up in the ancient dictum know thyself or seek the seeker. When Ramana spoke the words seemed to come out of an abyss. One could see immaculate purity and non-attachment in him and his movements. In his vicinity, the mind's distractions were overpowered by an austere and potent calmness, and the unique bliss of peace was directly experienced. Again and again he gave us the teaching that the real Maharshi was not the body which people saw. It was the inner being. Those who never made the journey to India during his lifetime may take comfort in this thought, that it is possible to invoke his presence wherever they are and to feel its reality in the heart. Ramana wrote very little and taught mainly through the tremendous power of silence. The writings of Ramana were created mostly to meet the specific needs of others and fall into two general categories. The first is where perfect knowledge is combined with the ecstasy of devotion. Tears of joy streamed down his face as he wrote them. These devotional poems mirror the aspect of longing and the bliss of fulfillment. The other writings enunciate his teachings in both poetry and prose. These include clear expositions of the nature of God, the mind, the world, and the individual. Just as Ramana realized the self without previous spiritual or philosophical instruction, he attached little importance to theoretical study. Therefore, his writings focus on the practical approach of turning toward the source of self-knowledge, rather than getting lost in the never-ending cycle of intellectual discussion. Ramana indicated that the heart was another name for God or the self. It is called heart since it is the source from which the universe rises. He stated, the heart is not physical. In Sanskrit, heart is hridaya, which means that which is the center. It is that from which thoughts arise, on which they subsist, and where they are resolved. The heart is the center of it all. It is said to be the infinite. In the book, Ramana Arunachala, Arthur Osborne writes, It was the most majestic film I've ever seen. 
the most awe-inspiring, and yet without incident. A view of the Arunachala Hill from the Ashram Drive, and then a tall, frail, light-complexioned man with short white hair descending the slope of the hill with the aid of a staff. Then he was seen coming out of the ashram hall, stopping to smile to a baby, walking across the ashram ground, just simple, everyday actions. The simplicity was so natural, so spontaneous. After years of living in caves upon the Arunachala Hill, the Maharshi moved down to its base, near the resting place of his mother. After a short time, a small ashrama began to take shape around him, and what is now the current Sri Ramanashramam had its modest beginning. Seekers from all backgrounds and religions came to be in his presence. Ramana sat in a modest hall, available day and night to answer questions from sincere seekers. His only possessions were a loincloth and a towel. He never asked anything from anyone. Until the frailty of age set in, there were no set hours for approaching him. During the final year of his life, devotees were requested to let him rest at midday. In response to this request by ashram authorities, Ramana himself sat outside the hall until the rule was retracted. His humanity and sense of equality was to be universal. In 1949, it was detected that the Maharshi had malignant sarcoma in his left arm. In spite of intense medical care, on April 14, 1950, his physical end was apparent. The last photo of Ramana was by the French photographer Henri Cartier-Bresson, taken just 10 days before the Maharshi left the body. In the evening, as devotees sat on the terrace outside the room built specially for his convenience during this last illness, they spontaneously began to sing the refrain to one of his stirring hymns to Arunachala. Arthur Osborne writes about that evening. On hearing it, Ramana's eyes open and shone. He gave a brief smile of indescribable tenderness. From the outer corner of his eyes, tears of bliss rolled down. One more deep breath, and no more. At that very moment, 8.47 p.m., an enormous star trailed slowly across the sky, passing to the northeast of the peak of Arunachala. The meteor was noted as far away as Bombay. 